Okay, next we have um, Chamia Chapman, who's a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. All right, hello everyone. My name is Shamia Chapman. I am a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and today I will be presenting my thesis work on the effects of co-exposure to polyethylene microplastics and Salmonella enterica typhimerium and Sika broiler chickens. So thank you for Dr. Jackson's talk earlier emphasizing the importance of co-exposure research. This particular co-exposure can occur throughout our food production chains, specifically in broiler housing and production facilities, where broilers, who are the meat producing chicken available globally, can be exposed to either microplastics or pathogens via contaminated feed or water from other animals, as well as uh, staff who may unknowingly bring in either of these contaminants. So microplastics have been defined a lot throughout this day, um, but to emphasize, they are considered small uh, plastic particles less than five millimeters in diameter for context. That is about the size of a sesame seed. And for this particular experiment, we utilize polyethylene fibers and powders as that's more ecologically relevant for the terrestrial environment we're testing. And polyethylene, as mentioned earlier, is typically used for food packaging and other single use plastic types. Salmonella enterica type of Miriam was selected um, based on our emphasis of seeing this particular serotype, serotype isolated from human salmonellosis cases, as well as from processed broiler meats. I want to highlight the SEM image on the screen here, which is of our polyethylene fibers, which were cut down using a cryotome and verify using scanning electron microscopy by my lab mate, Fuat Shatara, for this particular experiment. As microplastics are increasingly being found in environments where they can interact with pathogens like salmonella, it's becoming an increasing concern as well for the poultry industry. As seen with a lot of the USDA food recalls pictured here, this particular instance of microplastics or salmonella interacting in processed feed, specifically broiler meats, is very common. And knowing that many bacteria like to adhere and thrive on different biotic or abiotic surfaces makes this a huge public health issue moving forward. So our overall objective for this experiment was to elucidate the effects of both polyethylene microplastics and Salmonella enterica typhimerium and the Sika of the broiler chickens. And we aim to accomplish this particular objective through the use of two aims. The first aim was to look at overall microbial changes within our sequel mesocosms. And the second was to look at either similarities or differences between our sequel microbiome and metabolome. We hypothesized that co-exposure to the polyethylene microplastics as well as the Salmonella and Typhimerium would lead to more sequel microbiome and metabolome dysregulation, as well as, um, for, oh, excuse me, as well as looking at whether or not that would then affect overall exposure rates within these systems. In addition, we saw that, or we hypothesized that the microplastics, specifically the polyethylene fiber, would then cause more dysregulation compared to the polyethylene powder as larger surface areas mean more space for these different bacteria to grow and adhere and thrive. For this experimental design, we incorporated the use of sequel mesocosms, as I mentioned previously. This required the removal of the cecas from 10 broiler chickens. That sequel digester was then homogenized and diluted one to 3,000 in anaerobic digestion solution. As you can see, these are images of our sequel mesocosms that were utilized for this experiment. We had a total of 60 used for this one. We next then allowed these sequel mesocosms to acclimate for 24 hours under anaerobic conditions, um, during which time we set up our different treatment conditions. These included either the incorporation of our salmonella or our polyethylene fiber or our powder. Following this, we then inoculated all of our sequel mesocosms with their assigned treatment groups, after which we conducted several analyses. For today's talk, I will focus more on our 16S alumina sequencing results, as well as our untargeted metabolomics data. So again, we conducted 16S, metab 16S alumina sequencing, excuse me, to analyze the overall composition of our individual treatment groups. So pictured here is our relative abundance plot. Along the x-axis are all of our treatment conditions. Along the y-axis highlight our relative abundance from zero to one. 
And the legend provided at the very bottom highlight the genera and other taxa identified within our system by color-coded boxes. We then denoted our different time points, zero or 24 hours by the dashed line going vertically across our uh, plot here. Each of these treatment groups then had approximately 10 samples um, per time point to give context to the amount of replicates we then provided for the sequencing. So initially we saw a lot of variation between individual samples, but we knew we needed to zone in a little bit more to fully understand what was going on within our sequel microbiomes. Based on a lot of literature searches, we noticed in dietary fiber studies using either human or even other species, different microbiome samples, they focus on two taxes. The first was bacteroides and the second, were the firmicutes. By focusing in on these two particular taxa, we then saw a greater variation of the bacteroides within our system, specifically seeing that our PE fiber groups had a higher abundance of our bacteroides. The next step then was to take a greater look at these phyla on a more zoomed in level. But by then plotting the mean relative abundance of these phyla, I was able to zone in on the firmicutes and bacteroides a little bit more specifically within these systems. So again, with this mean relative abundance plot, plotted along the x-axis, we then have all of our phyla along that y-axis in this plot. We do see again that our two treatment groups of interest at this point, our PE fiber containing groups, do in fact have higher levels of bacteroides present within the system. To further confirm this finding, I then calculated our firm acute bacteroides ratio, which as you can see in the highlighted box shows that these PE fiber containing groups have much lower um, ratios than our other treatment groups. Notably, our PE powder containing groups also have a lower ratio compared to our other treatment groups, but it does not have as much of an effect as our PE fiber containing groups. So why do we care about this from acute bacteroides ratio? This ratio is used in a lot of different dietary studies and has been used as a study metric to analyze different gut dysbiosis and other diseases within the gut microbiome. Further to that point, an increased ratio has been associated with obesity, while a decreased ratio has been associated with a increase in inflammatory bowel disease outcomes in different models, including humans as well as mice that have been tested. So next I wanna highlight our untargeted metabolomics data. We conducted untargeted metabolomics using mass spectrometry to get an idea of our total uh, presence of small molecules within our individual treatments. Each of our treatment groups then is outlined in the PCA plot that's pictured here. You'll notice a, slight, a very distinct clustering of our individual treatment groups based on the presence or absence of that salmonella being inoculated into that system. This was very interesting finding for us because unlike the microbiome data where we saw distinct differences of our PE fiber and powder, we actually see them more closely related here. So what are some of those metabolites that seem to stand out when we have a presence of salmonella? These are a few that I wanted to highlight for today's talk. The first, simulanoquinoline, is actually a CYP3A4 inhibitor. That's a member of the cytochrome P450 in, uh, family. So this particular enzyme is utilized for bowel acid uh, detoxification within the liver and gastrointestinal tract. So that was a very interesting finding. Further, we found uh, asparaginal tryptophan and tryptophan biosynthesis and metabolism is very common within salmonella species and also within salmonella typhimerium strains. So that again was a confirmation of we are seeing our salmonella acting in this metabolome. And lastly, we saw pyridoxamine, which is a vitamin B6, um, well, a form of vitamin B6. And interestingly, I found a published study that highlighted that salmonella typhimerium strains actually lack a, a binding protein in the periplasmic membrane that does not allow for metabolism of this particular vitamin B6. So you do end up seeing an accumulation of it within the system. So those are just some highlights of compounds related to the salmonella acting on our sequel metabolome. So next, we wanted to also take a closer look on what was occurring with our microplastics within the sequel metabolome. And in order to do that, we then performed these different pairwise analyses. So pictured here are our volcano plots. Along the x-axis, you'll see our fold to change, uh, so log to fold change of our individual metabolite concentrations at this point. So instead of looking at total metabolome, we're now zoning in more on individual metabolites being present. 
along that y-axis then are the p-values from those two tests. Again, looking at these different pairwise comparisons of our treatment groups. You'll notice here that our, uh, I don't, did it change for you all? I think, yeah, okay, so sorry, on my screen it looks slightly different. Um, so our PE powder, again, is showing no um, effect on our sequel metabolome, and again, confirming that we are seeing the salmonella then acting on our metabolome instead. Unlike the PE powder, we actually do see the PE fiber acting on our uh, sequel metabolome and causing more dysregulation, again, seeing with those same volcano plots and pairwise comparisons, uh, which interestingly highlights for us, again, the salmonella as well as the PE fiber as a co-exposure seem to cause more dysregulation within the sequel metabolome. So again, just further emphasize that point, when we add fiber and salmonella, we get a lot more of that dysregulation as opposed to a single exposure of our salmonella typhimerium. So you may be asking, well, what are the metabolites associated with just that fiber? And some that we did find very interestingly were two uh, molecules, the first being hexaethylene glycol, as well as octaethylene glycol, which are a part of the polyethylene glycol organic compound list, um, which we assume may be leaching from our polyethylene fibers more than our powders, which was a very cool finding to see. Um, and then the last compound here, nettomycin, is actually has some bactericidal effects. Um, so that way it can actually prevent protein synthesis in selected microorganisms and other organisms in the system. So that could be potentially uh, adsorbing to our PE fiber more than our powder within the system. And we assume it may be coming from our chicken feed that was actually incorporated in the system as a source of nutrition as these uh, sequel mesocosms had to grow. So I'd like to conclude with a few key points and takeaways from this presentation today. The first is that the sequel microbiome was altered more by RP fiber versus the powder, uh, which does indicate to us that the polymer type as well as size and other surface characteristics do have a big part in how the sequel microbiome and metabolome can be altered. Secondly, we do know that the Salmonella and Terica typhimerium that we inoculated the system with had a very strong influence on our sequel metabolome as seen with our PCA plots as well as all of the volcano plots show today. And lastly, we know that that co-exposure right, of the PE fiber as well as that salmonella typhimerium truly had a greater dysregulation as opposed to a single exposure of either of those contaminants in the system. With that, I would like to thank everyone in the Majumdre lab as well as everyone across the UW-Madison campus who has helped make this project possible. And of course, my funding sources with SciMed and my T32. Thank you. Okay, so your data shows pretty strongly, right? The presence of the polyester fibers affected both the composition of the microbiome and then the metabolome. What, what do you what do you think is the mechanism? Like what what, it, what about the plastic is affecting the microbes? Is it is there, are there chemicals that are leaching off of it? Do you think it's a surface interaction? Is there something else happening? Like, what do you think is going yeah, on? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's that's sort of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, it, you know, we can't say for certain, right? But we do think that there are a lot of characteristics that play a part in this. Um, having seen those polyethylene glycols, we know there is some sort of leaching, which could also affect both the microbiome and metabolome, um, but it's no doubt based on a lot of literature and what we're also seeing that those surface characteristics of the fiber versus the powder could also play a big role in that as well. So it could be a combination of everything in, in a sense. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you.